how hard is it to build the metaverse? What is the metaverse in your view? You started with discussing and thinking about Quake as a kind of a metaverse. As you think about it today, what is the metaverse, the thing that could create this compelling user value, this experience that will change the world, and how hard is it to build it? So the term comes from Neil Stevenson's book, Snow Crash, which mm -hmm. many of us had read back in the 90s. It was one of those kind of formative books. And there was this sense that the the possibilities and kind of the the freedom and unlimited capabilities to build a virtual world that that does whatever you want whatever you ask of it has been a powerful draw for generations of developers you know game developers specifically and people that are thinking about more uh, more general purpose applications so we were talking about that back in the doom and quake days about how do you wind up with an interconnected set of worlds that you kind of visit from one to another and as web pages were becoming a thing you start thinking about how what is the interactive kind of 3D based equivalent of this and there were a lot of really bad takes you had you know, like uh, vermal then uh, virtual reality markup languages and there's aspects like that 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 came from people saying, well, what would what kind of capabilities should we develop to, to enable this? Mm -hmm. And that kind of capability first work has usually not panned out very well. Uh, on the other hand, we have successful games that started with things like Doom and Quake and communities that formed around those. And uh, whether it was server lists in the early days or you know, literal portaling between different games. And then modern things that are on completely different order of magnitude, like Minecraft and Fortnite that have 100 million plus users. Mm. Um, you know, I still think that that's the right way to go to build the metaverse is you build something that's amazing that people love and people wind up spending all their time in uh, because it's awesome. And you expand the capabilities of that. So now, even if it's a very basic experience, as long as people, awesome, Minecraft is Minecraft is yeah, an amazing case study in so many things. As where basic as what's it gets. been able to be done with that is really enlightening, and there are other cases where, like right now, Roblox is basically a game construction kit aimed at kids, and that was a capability first play, and it's achieving scale that's on the same order of those things. So. It's not impossible, but my preferred bet would be you make something amazing that people love and you make it better and better. And that's where I could say we could have gone back and followed a path kind of like that in the early days. If you just kind of take the same game, whether it's when Activision demonstrated that you could make Call of Duty every year, and not only is it not bad, people kind of love it and it's a, it's very profitable. The idea that you could have taken something like that, it, take a great game, release a new version every year that lets the capabilities grow and expand to start saying it's like, okay, it's a game about running around and shooting things, but now you can have, uh, bring your media into it. You can uh, add persistence of social sense signs of life or whatever you want to add to it. Uh, I still think that's you know, quite a good uh, position to take. And I think that while Meta is doing a bottoms-up capability approach with Horizon Worlds, where it's a fairly general purpose, creators can build whatever they want in their sort of thing, I am, you know, it's it's hard to compare and compete with something like Fortnite, which also has enormous amounts of creativity, even though it was not designed originally as a general purpose sort of thing. So there's we have examples on both sides. Me personally, I would have bet on uh, trying to do entertainment, valuable destination first, and expanding from there. So, can you imagine the thing that will be kind of if, if we look back a couple of centuries from now, and you think about the experiences that marked the singularity, the transition in where most of our world moved into virtual reality. What do you think those experiences will look like? So I do think it's going to be kind of like the way the web slowly took over, where you're you're the, the frog in the pot of water that's slowly heating up, where having lived through all of that, I remember when it was shocking to start seeing uh, seeing the first website address on a billboard when you're like, hey, my computer world is in infecting the real world. Mm -hmm. You know, this is spreading out uh, in some way. But there's still, when you look back and say, well, what, what made the web take off? And it wasn't a big bang sort of moment there. It was a bunch of little things that turned out not to even be the things that are relevant now. 
that brought them into it. So well, I wonder if from, I mean, like you said, you're not a historian. So maybe there's a historian out there that could really identify that moment, data-driven way. It could be like MySpace or something like that. Maybe the first major social network that really reached into non-geek world or something like that. I think that's kind of the fallacy of historians, though, <laughs> looking for some of those kind of primary dominant causes where so many of these things are like we see an exponential curve, but it's not because like one thing is going exponential. It's because we have hundreds of little sigmoid curves overlapped on top of each other, and they just happen to keep adding up so that you've got something kind of going exponential at any given point. But not, no single one of them was the critical thing. There were you know dozens and dozens of things. I mean, seeing the transitions of stuff like as obviously MySpace giving way to other things, but even like blogging giving way to uh, to social media and getting resurrected in other guises and, and the memes things with that the happened there. Dancing baby gif or whatever yeah. the all all your base now belong to us. Whatever those early memes that led to the modern memes and the humor on the different the different evolution of humor on the internet that I'm sure the historians will also write books about uh from the different websites that support that create the infrastructure for that humor like Reddit and all that kind of stuff. So people will go back and they will name firsts and critical moments, yeah. but it's probably going to be a poor approximation of what actually happens. And we've already seen like in the VR space where it didn't play out the way we thought it would in terms of what was going to be like when it, the modern era of VR basically started with my E3 demo of Doom 3 on the Rift prototype. So we're like first person shooters in VR, match made in heaven, right? Mm -hmm. And that didn't work out that way at all. They have, you know, they have the most comfort problems with it. And then the most popular virtual reality app is Beat Saber, which nobody predicted back then. What's that make you, uh, like, f from first principles, if you were to, like, reverse engineer that? Why are these, like, silly, fun games well, the it, most? It actually makes very clear sense when you when you analyze it from uh, from hindsight and look at the engineering reasons, where it's not just that it was a magical, quirky idea. It was something that played almost perfectly to what turned out to be the real strengths of VR, where the one thing that I really underestimated importance in VR was the importance of the controllers. You know, I was still thinking we could do a lot more with uh, with the gamepad and just the amazingness of taking any existing game, being able to move your head around and look around, that that was, you know, that was really amazing. But the controllers uh, were super important. But the problem is so many things that you do with the controllers just suck. It feels like it breaks the illusion, like trying to pick up glasses with the controllers where you're like, oh, use the grip button when you're kind of close and it'll snap into your hand. All of those things are unnatural uh, actions that you do them and it's still part of the VR experience. But Beat Saber winds up uh, playing only to the strengths. It completely hides all the weaknesses of it because you are holding something in your hand. You keep a solid grip on it the whole time. It slices through things without ever bumping into things. You never get into the point where, you know, I'm knocking on this table, but in VR, my hand just goes right through it. So you've got something that slices through. So it's never your brain telling you, oh, I should have hit something. You've got a lightsaber here. Mm -hmm. It's just you expect it to slice through everything. Uh, audio and music turned out to be a really powerful aspect of virtual reality where you're blocking the world off and constructing the world around you. And I, uh, and being something that can run efficiently on even this relatively low powered hardware and can have a valuable loop in a small amount of time where a lot of modern games, you're supposed to sit down and play it for an hour just to get anywhere. Sometimes a new game takes an hour to get through the tutorial level. And that's not good for VR for a couple reasons. You do still have the comfort issues if you're moving around at all, but you've also got just you know discomfort from the headset, battery lifespan on the mobile versions. So having things that do break down into three and four minute windows of play, that turns out to be very valuable from a gameplay standpoint. So it winds up being kind of a perfect storm of all of these things that are really good. It doesn't have any of the comfort problems. You're not navigating around. You're standing still. All the stuff flies at you. It has placed audio strengths. I, it adds the whole, the whole fitness in VR. Nobody was thinking about that back in the at the beginning. And it turns out that that is an excellent daily fitness thing to be doing. If you go play 
uh, an hour of Beat Saber or Supernatural or something. That is legit solid exercise, uh, and it's more fun than doing it just about any other way there. So that's kind of the arcade stage of things. If I were to say with my experience with VR, the thing that I think is powerful is the, maybe it's not here yet, but the degree to which it is immersive in the way that Quake is immersive. It takes you to another world. For me, because I'm a fan of role-playing games, uh, the Elder Scrolls series, uh, like Skyrim or even Daggerfall, it just takes you to another world. And when you're not in that world, you miss not being there. And then you just, you kind of want to stay there forever because life is shitty. Well, the, the whole point <laughs> you my just want to go to VR this place is yeah. that I there was a there was a time when I we were kind of asked to come up with like what's your view about VR and I am you know my pitch was that it should be better inside the headset than outside it's the world as you want it yeah and everybody thought that was dystopian and like that's like oh you're just going to forget about the world outside and I don't get that mindset where the idea that if you can make the world better inside the headset than outside, you've just improved the person's life that has a headset that can wear it. And there are plenty of things that we just can't do for everyone in the real world. Everybody can't have Richard Branson's private island, but everyone can have a private VR island and it can have the things that they want on it. And there's a lot of these kind of rivalrous goods in the real world that VR can just be better at. We can do a lot of things like that that can be very, very rich. So yeah, I want the, I think it's going to be a positive thing, this world where people want to go back into their headset, where it can be better than somebody that's living in a tiny apartment can have a palatial estate in virtual reality. They can have all their friends from all over the world come over and visit them without everybody getting on a plane and uh, and meeting in some place and dealing with all the other logistics hassles. There is real value in the you know, the presence that you can get for remote meetings. It's it's all the little things that we need to sort out, but those are things that we have line of sight on. People, you know, that have been in like a good VR meeting using work rooms where you can say, oh, that was better than a Zoom meeting. But of course, it's more of a hassle to get into it. Not everyone has the headset. Interoperability is worse. You can't have, you cap out at a certain number. There's all these things that need to be fixed, but that's one of those things you can look at and say, we know there's value there. We just need to really grind hard, file off all the rough edges and make that possible. So you do think we have line of sight because there's a, there's a reason like I, I, I do this podcast in person, for example. It, it's doing it remotely, it, it's not the same. And if you were, if somebody were to ask me why it's not the same, I wouldn't be able to write down exactly why. Um, but you're saying that it's possible, whatever the magic is for in-person interaction, that immersiveness of the experience, we are almost there. Yes. So, it's so a the idea of problem. like, I'm doing a VR interview with someone. I'm not saying it's here right now, but you can see glimmers of what it should be. And we largely know what would need to be fixed and improved to, like you say, there's a difference between a remote interview doing a podcast over Zoom or something and face-to-face. -face. There's that sense of presence, that immediacy, the super low latency responsiveness, being able to see all the subtle things there, just occupying the same field of view. And all of those are things that we absolutely can do in VR. And that simple case of a small meeting with a couple people, that's the much easier case than everybody thinks the Ready Player One multiverse with a thousand people going across a, you know, a huge bridge to amazing places. That's harder in a lot of other technical ways. Not to say we can't also do that, but that's further away and has more challenges. But this small thing about being able to have a meeting with one or a few people and have it feel real, feel like you're there. Uh, like you have the same interactions and talking with them. You get subtle cues as we start getting eye and face tracking and some of the other things on high-end headsets. A lot of that is going to come over and it doesn't have to be as good. This is an important thing that people miss where there was a lot of people that, especially rich people, that would look at VR and say, it's like, oh, this just isn't that good. 
And I'd say it's like, well, you've already been courtside, backstage, and you know, on pit row, and you've done all of these experiences because you get to do them in real life. But most people don't get to. And even if the experience is only half as good, if it's something that they never would have gotten to do before, it's still a very good thing. And as we can just we can push that number up over time. It has a minimum viable value level when it does something that is valuable enough to people, as long as it's better inside the headset on any metric than it is outside and people choose to go there, we're on the right path. And we have a value gradient that I'm just always hammering on. We can just follow this value gradient, just keep making things better rather than going for that one close your eyes, swing for the fences. I am kind of silver bullet approach. <laughs> well, I wonder if there's a value gradient for in-person meetings, because if you get that right, I mean, that would change the world. Yeah. That, that it doesn't need to, I mean, you don't need a uh, ready player one. I, I But I wonder if there's th that value gradient you can follow along, because if there is and you follow it, then uh, there'll be a certain like face shift at a certain point where people will shift from um, from Zoom to this, uh, I wonder what what are the bottlenecks? Is it software? Is it hardware? Is it like is it is it all about latency? So I have big arguments internally about strategic things like that. Where I like the next headset that's coming out and that we've made various announcements about is going to be a higher end headset, more expensive, more features. Lots of people want to make those those trade offs. I. You know, we'll see what the market has to say about the, the exact trade-offs we've made here. But if you want to replace Zoom, you need to have something that everybody has. <laughs> I'm, and so you like something. cheaper. I like cheaper because also lighter and cheaper wind up being uh, a virtuous cycle there where expensive and more features tends to also lead towards heavier. And it just kind of goes, it's like, let's add more features. The features are not, uh, you know, they have physical presence and weight and draw from batteries and all of those things. So I've always favored a lower end, uh, cheaper, faster approach. Uh, that's why I was always behind the, the mobile side of VR rather than the higher end PC headsets. And I think that's, you know, that's proven out well. But there's, uh, you always, ideally we have a whole range of things, but if you've only got one or two things, it's important that those two things cover the, uh, you know, the scope that you think is most important. When we're in a world when it's like cell phones and there's 50 of them on the market covering every conceivable ecological niche you want, that's going to be great, but we're not going to be there for a while. Where are the bottlenecks? Is it the hardware or the software? Yeah. So right now, I, uh, you can play, you can get uh, work rooms on Quest and you can set up these things and it's a pretty good experience. It's surprisingly good. So I haven't tried it. Yeah. It's surprisingly good. Uh, yeah, you know, the, I've, the voice it, latency is better on that than uh, a lot better than a Zoom meeting. So you've got a more a better sense of immediacy there. The expressions that you get from the, the current hardware with just kind of your controllers and your head is pretty realistic feeling. You've got a pretty good sense of being there with someone with Are it. these like... Uh avatars of people yeah. like do mm. you do you, get, do you get to see their body yeah the mm. upper, and they're sitting around a table yeah and it feel it feels, it feels better than zoom better than you yeah better than you'd expect for that it is definitely yeah i'd say it's it's quite a bit better than zoom when everything's working right but there's still all the rough edges of the reason zoom became so successful is because they just nailed the usability of everything mm -hmm. it's high quality with a absolutely first rate experience and we are not there yet with any of the VR stuff. I'm trying to to push hard to get, I, I keep talking about, it, it's like it needs to just be one click to make everything happen. Yeah. And we're getting there in our, our home environment, not the whole workrooms application, but the main home where you can now kind of go over and click an invite and it still winds up taking five times longer than it should. But we're getting close to that where you click there, they click on their button, and then they're sitting there in this good yeah. presence with you. But latencies need to get a lot better. User interface needs to get a lot better. Um, ubiquity of the headsets needs to get better. We need to have 100 million of them uh, out there just so that everybody knows somebody that uses this all the time. Well, I think it's a virtuous cycle because I do think the interface is the thing that makes or breaks this kind of revolution. It's so interesting how like uh, you said one click, but it's also like how you achieve that one click. I don't know what is um 
can I ask a dark question? Maybe let's keep it outside of Meta, but this is about Meta, but also Google and big company. Are they able to do this kind of thing? It seems like, let me put on my cranky old man hat, mm -hmm. is they seem to not do a good job of creating these user-friendly interfaces as they get bigger and bigger as a company. Like Google has created some of the greatest interfaces ever uh, early on and it's, I mean, creating Gmail, um, just so many brilliant interfaces. And it just seems to be getting crappier and crappier at that. Same with Meta, same with uh, uh, Microsoft. It's just, it seems to get worse and worse at that. It's this, I don't know what it is, it, because you've become more conservative, careful, risk averse. Is that why? Can you so speak to that? It's been really eye opening to me working inside a tech titan where. I am, you know, I I had my small companies, and then we we're acquired by a you know a mid-sized game publisher, and then uh, Oculus getting acquired by Meta, and Meta has grown by a factor of many just in the the eight years since the acquisition. So I did not have experience with this, and it's it was interesting because I remember like previously my benchmark for. Uh, kind of use of resources was some of the government programs I interacted with on the aerospace side. And I remember thinking there was, okay, there's an Air Force program and they spent $50 million and they didn't, they didn't launch anything. They didn't even build anything. It was just kind of like they, I, you know, they made a bunch of papers and had some parts in, uh, in a warehouse and nothing came of it. It's like $50 million. I am, um, and I have I've had to radically recalibrate my sense of like how much money can be spent with I uh, without with a product at the end resources, where yeah. on the ver the plus side VR has turned out we've built pretty much exactly what you know we just passed the ten year mark then from my I uh, like my first demo of the Rift and if I could have said what I wanted to have it would have been a standalone inside out tracked. 4K resolution headset that I that could still plug into a PC for high end rendering, and that's exactly what we've got on Quest Two yes, right now. First of all, let's pause on that with me being cranky and everything. It's what Meta achieved uh, with Oculus and so on is incredible. I mean, this is this what when I thought about the future of VR, this is what I imagined in terms of hardware. I would say, and maybe in terms of the experience as well, but it's still not there somehow. On the one hand, we did kind of achieve it and win, and we've got, we've sold, you know, we're a success right now, but the amount of resources that have gone into it, it winds up getting cluttered up in accounting where last, Mark did announce that they spent $10 billion a year, like on Reality Labs. Now, Reality Labs covers a lot. It was, VR was not the large part of it. It also had Portal and Spark and the big AR research efforts. And it's been expanding out to include AI and other things there where uh, there's a lot going on there. But $10 billion was just a number that I had trouble processing. It's just, it, I feel sick to my stomach thinking about that much mm. money being spent. But that's how they they demonstrate commitment to this where it's not I'm um, more so than like, yeah, Google goes and cancels all of these projects, uh, different things I. Uh, like that, while Meta is really sticking with the funding of VR and AR is still further out with it. So there's something to be said for that. I, it's not just going to vanish. The work's going in. I just wish it could be, all those resources could be applied more effectively because yeah. I see all these cases. I point out these examples of how a third party that we're kind of competing with in various ways, there's a number of these examples, and they do work with a tenth of the people that we do internally. Uh, and a lot of it comes from, yes, there's the small company can just go do it while in a big company, you do have to worry about, I, uh, you know, is there some SDK internally that you should be using because another team's making it? You have to have your cross-functional uh, group meetups for different things. You do have more concerns about, you know, about privacy or diversity and equity and uh, safety of different things, parental issues and things that a small startup company can just kind of, you know, cowboy off and do something interesting. And there's a lot more that is a problem that you have to pay attention to in the big companies, but I'm not willing to believe that we are within even a, a factor of two or four of what the efficiency could be. You know, I I am constantly 
kind of crying out for. It's like, we can do better than this. Yeah, and you wonder what the mechanisms to unlock that efficiency yeah. are. You know, I, I don't, there is some sense in a large company that like an individual engineer might not believe that they can change the world. Maybe you d you delegate a little bit of the responsibility to be the one who changes the world in a big company, I think. But the reality is like the world will get changed by a single engineer anyway. So if whether inside Google or inside a startup, it doesn't matter. It's just like Google and Meta needs to help those engineers believe. Yeah, They're the I ones tried, that are gonna yeah. decrease that latency. It's, it'll take one John Carmack, like the 20 year old Carmack that's inside Meta right now to change everything. And I try to point that out and push people. It's like, try to go ahead and when you see something, because there is, you get the silo mentality where you're like, okay, I know something's not right over there, but that's, I'm staying in my lane here. I, and there's, there's a couple people that I can, you know, I can think about that are willing to just like hop all over the place. And man, I treasure them. The people that are just willing to, they're fearless. You know, they will go over and they will go rebuild the kernel and change this distribution and go in and hack the firmware over here to, to get something done right. And that is relatively rare. You know, there's thousands of developers and you've got a small handful that are willing to operate at that level. And, you know, and it's potentially risky for them. The, the politics are, you know, are real in a lot of that. And I'm in the, you know, very much the privileged position of, I am, you know, I'm more or less untouchable there where I've been dinged like twice for, it's like you said something insensitive in that post and I, and you should probably not say that. I am, but for the most part, yes, I, I you know I get away with I, every week I'm posting something you know pretty loud and opinionated in you know internally, and I think that's useful for the company. But um, yeah, it's not a, it's rare to have a position like that, and I can't necessarily offer advice for how someone can do that. I well, you could offer advice to a company in general to give a little bit of freedom for the young wild like the wildest ideas come from the young minds. Uh, and so you need to give the young minds freedom to to think big and wild and, and crazy. And for that, they have to be opinionated. They have to be, um, they have to think crazy ideas and thoughts and pursue them with a full passion without being slowed down by bureaucracy or managers and all that kind of stuff. Um, obviously startups really empower that, yeah. but big companies could too. And that's that's a design challenge for company, for big companies to see how can you enable that? How can you yeah, empower because the that? Because big company, there are so many resources there right. and they do, you know, amazing things do get accomplished, but there's so much more that could come out of that. And, uh, you know, I'm hope I'm always hopeful. I'm an optimist in almost everything. You know, I think things can get better. I think that they can improve things that, you go through a path and you're learning uh, kind of what does and doesn't work. And I'm not, I'm not ready to be fatalistic about the kind of the outcome of any of that. Uh, me neither. I know too many good people inside of those large companies that are incredible.